This is the Wisdom Podcast. The Wisdom Podcast features interviews with leading thinkers from the Buddhist world. I can tell you how many students I helped not drop out during my career as a yeah. professor yeah. by saying, well, if you want to cultivate a Dharma side or some kind of spiritual side, that's good, but also you should work on your livelihood. It's not enough for Buddhist practitioners simply to be preoccupied with their own awakening. Yes. We've also, we also need to awaken to what's going on socially and institutionally. If there is a future life, then the best way to prepare for it is to live fully and honestly and truthfully and compassionately and lovingly and wisely now. And if there's not a future life, then you've done the best you possibly can here and now. Each episode takes you on a fascinating exploration of Buddhism and meditation as our guests share stories and discuss life-changing practices, timeless philosophies, and new ways to think and live. Actually, if I go back to being in the doctor's office yeah. that day, that, so that's a year and a half before learning meditation, this was a kind of an encounter with the heavenly messengers. Tonight, for the first time, the Wisdom Podcast is being recorded in front of a live audience. It is also being live streamed around the world. All these initiatives help to further Wisdom Publications' mission of connecting you with Buddhist wisdom. And now, please welcome tonight's guest, teacher and scholar, Alan Wallace. I wrote in my journal on the summer's, late summer's day in Bergen, on the west coast of Norway, I need to meet a wise old man and I need it quickly. You know, basically, and I'm not sure I kind of believed or disbelieved, I was quite kind of amorphous about God and the divine, but just like, hello university, I need universe, not university. I need a wise old man. And I was hitchhiking on this long road from, Os from Bergen to Oslo by myself, and after waiting about four or five hours by side of the road, a little black VW bug pulled over to the side. A little old man waved to me, would like a ride, and it turned out he was a Buddhist monk <laughs> and a fascinating person. He lived in Nepal, he lived with Tibetans, and I learned all of this in about 10 minutes because he took me about 10 minutes down the road and then dropped me off because he lived in a chalet up in the mountains. But he learned I was interested in Buddhism. We corresponded for years after that. But that was, that was kind of a wake-up call because 1970, how many Buddhist monks were there in Europe? I think you probably count them on one maximum two hands. And he came right when I called. And it kind of made me feel, well, there are coincidences, and then there are coincidences, and there's a point which to say coincidence is just stupid. And this seemed to be one of the stupid times, just to say that, yeah, well, it happens. Yeah, it did. That was really a coincidence. But then when I followed, you know, when I kept on, I went down to Göttingen and find there was a Tibetan Lama who had just been appointed by the Dalai Lama to be on faculty. I, I studied with him, went off to Switzerland, trained there for a few months for the summer, and then bought, my safe, bought myself a one-way ticket to India and immersed myself for the next four years. But in short, the, what really pulled me was on, on the one hand a very deep intuitive sense of Dzogchen, which I didn't understand. I just felt, this is it. And it was 20 years before circumstances came together for me to really have an opportunity to immerse myself in the study and practice of Dzogchen, and that was 1990 with Gyatso Rinpoche. Until then, it was all Gulupa, Theravada, Sakya. Uh, but it was, but on a more cognitive level, I found here a tradition that was not simply religion, it's not simply science, not simply philosophy, it, it includes all three elements, but what really caught me, and then it's held me ever since, is here is a path of ever-deepening meaning but also ever-deepening insight, understanding, knowledge, and they're all bound into one. Wisdom and skillful means, you could say. Mm -hmm. And that's been enormously compelling for me. And so you went to India basically in search of meaning. You had facts from the science side of things, so you, you're looking for meaning. But then you end up coming back to the States. Yeah. And where do you go? You end up at Amherst studying physics, is that right? Well, I'll backtrack once again, so I, during, during my year in Göttingen, because yeah. I was supposed to be there for an academic year, wound up dropping all my classes that I was intending to do. Uh, struck terror in the hearts of my parents, because they thought I was throwing away my whole entire future, which of course I did. Um, but I read voraciously for that. I basically became a hermit for nine months, 
and just read voraciously and then wind up dropping all my classes except for Tibetan language because I figured this is my path and in 1970 there were very few people who were bilingual so if I was serious about this and I was then I've got to learn how to read and speak Tibetan so that's all I did and then read voraciously and you asked about when I started reading I started practicing meditation I started TM transcendental meditation a year or two earlier uh, and that was good um, but I wanted more and I picked up a marvelous book, and it's the, um, the Heart of Buddhist Meditation by Jnana Pondikatera, outstanding German scholar who was trained for years. I, I met him years later in 1980. Uh, it's an outstanding, it's still a classic, and it covers the Mahasantipatthana Sutta, an excellent commentary to it. I read that, and just read it on my own, I had no teacher, but I thought, I can practice that. This really makes sense. And it was not just meaning, because if I'd wanted meaning, I could have maybe tried to just adopt some aberrant form of Christianity and you know, be a good heretical Christian. Uh, but I was looking for insight, for understanding, for knowledge. And here, the Satipatthana Sutra, the Satipatthana practice, the four close applications of mindfulness, that's just, that embodies that, because it's tremendously meaningful. And yet it's so smart, it's so sharp, it's intelligent, it's radically empirical. Uh, and so I immersed myself and started practicing then, in 1970, on my own in Germany, and then bought myself a one-way ticket to India. Okay. Yeah. And, and so then when you came back and started at Amherst, I'm wondering what was the thought? Why, why after spending four years in Dharamsala, you know, meeting all these lamas, yeah. I think uh, Geshe Rabdan, right? Yeah. His whole is Dalai Lama, and then you come back and then there's this pull back into academia. And I was wondering what the motivation behind that was. Sure. Sure. Well, it was more than four years. So I was in Dharamsala from 71 to 75. I uh, had tremendous and repeated health problems one after another. Three cases of hepatitis. I think I got typhoid. I had three types of worms. The list goes on and on. It was uh, physically very, very tough and mentally and spiritually just a feast. I mean, it was terrific, but it also really took a lot of wear and tear on the body. And then by that time, by 1971, I had a personal connection with His Holiness Dalai Lama. He was my, he has been, is, and will be my root guru since 71. And so after being there, and I, was, I received my full ordination from him in, in 1975, uh, just a few months after my ordination with him, full ordination, then I met with him because my, my teacher who gave me my novice ordination two years earlier had been posted to become abbot of the monastery, the Rikon Monastery in, in Switzerland. And that, again, my second home, so I met with him and, and just simply asked him, where can I be of greatest benefit? Shall I stay here in Dharmasala, continue meditating, and so on? I'd also spent more than a year in the Buddhist school of dialectics, so I'd had fairly rigorous training there. So I sh shall I stay here in Dharmasala, or shall I accompany my teacher back to Switzerland? By then I was fluent in Tibetan, I could serve as an interpreter, continue my own training, and do whatever is helpful. And he said, go west, young man. Mm -hmm. And so in 1975, then I went back to Switzerland, spent four and a half years there, uh, translating for him. Eventually I was teaching, I was translating, writing, practicing. But after about nine or ten years, by the time I got to the end of the 70s, it would been, had been pretty intensive training, lots and lots of teaching, including a good d dose of Theravada, which I received from one monk who came to Dharamsala and I studied with him intensely uh, for a summer, maybe a bit more. Uh, but then after, night, by the end of 1979, I just felt kind of saturated with undigested knowledge that I had understood but not assimilated. So I wrote to His Holiness and said, all I want to do now is meditate for a while. And where shall I go? Shall I go back to America, stay in Switzerland, come back to India? And he said, come to India, I'll teach you. I'll teach you meditation. I didn't take long to decide what to do. And so I spent the next four years, from beginning of 1980 for the, through, through the end of 1983, uh, basically just in a series of meditative retreats in India, Sri Lanka, uh, Insight Meditation Society right here in Boston, or outside of Boston, and, and uh, living with the Quakers out in uh, Arizona, and so on. Four years then just, just meditating. And by that time, I'd really been out of the mainstream of Western civilization for 13 years. And I would often say, not really in jest, that I was born at the age of 20. I just moved with my, with my pals in India or Switzerland and so forth. I would say I was born at the age of 20, because that's the, the age at which things started making sense. And before that, the first 20 years was a drum roll to actually having, you know, beginning what I thought was a meaningful life. But by the time I was 20, 33, almost 34, then I just thought, 
I went to Asia and I immersed myself in Tibetan culture and primarily in Buddha Dharma to seek integration, to live a whole and meaningful and truthful life, integrating meaning and wisdom, insight, knowledge. And what I'd done in the process was completely bifurcate myself into the first 20 years and the last 14 and had alienated myself from my own culture. So I felt a stranger in my own home and completely discontinued my Western education. And I thought, well, maybe now, after 14 years of quite thorough immersion in a very different culture and whole spiritual tradition, maybe it's time to integrate, to begin integrating. And so I w was accepted at Amherst College, to, which I, was an enormous privilege. It's an outstanding college. And uh, that was in 84, and decided to study physics. Because mm -hmm. I thought, Here, here's the paradigm, here's, the, here's the, the template for Western science as a whole. Galileo started it, and all the other branches of science suffer from physics envy, I've been told. Uh, you know, emulating this tremendous success story of physics, going back to Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and on. Uh, there is science at its most dazzling, one could say, from my perspective. And so I said, why not study that, you know, and then do, and do all the hard work, do the mathematics, do from classical mechanics and electromagnetism all the way through. But what I was really <coughs> curious about was quantum mechanics. And so I thought, if there's going to be some real meaningful engagement between modern physics and the Buddhist tradition, which I've been, I've been trained by them for 14 years, I thought it's going to be here, quantum mechanics. Because this is now challenging a lot of the absolutes that pervaded classical physics, absolute space, time, matter, energy. Uh, so I won't elaborate in quantum mechanics, but I was very intrigued. And so that's what I did. I had a, mar a marvelous mentor who I'm, whose name I'm glad to mention, Arthur Zions. Uh, he remains one of my dearest friends, and he really took me under his wing. He guided me through my training in history of physics, philosophy of science, uh, quantum mechanics, and with Bob Thurman, I studied Sanskrit, and I wrote a 500-page thesis and left a very happy camper. <laughs> How old are you at this stage? 36 when I graduated. Wow, so you fit so much in already. And, and at that time you were studying, you were still, I think you were still, you know, getting teachings. I think you met up with Gen Lem Rimpa, um, and you were also going out to the California desert and doing retreats and all this, all this kind of things. And so I'm wondering, um, I'm w I was wondering particularly about Gen Lam Rinpa, and he, he's rumored uh, um, to have achieved uh, shamatha, and I was wondering if where your interest in shamatha practice came from, and whether he was an influence on you in that regard. Yeah. So, during my years, two and a half years, at Amherst, they gave me two semesters, and I was writing a very big thesis, so I asked him for one more semester, because I was full scholarship. I came out without that, without debt which is enormous, I have enormous gratitude for Amherst for that. So I spent five semesters there. Uh, and during that time I was still ordained, I was a monk. So I was a Buddhist monk studying physics, mathematics, history of science, philosophy of science, um, but an incognito monk. And then when I graduated, all, all I wanted to do was go off into retreat again. So I went, slipped off to the eastern Sierra, the high desert of the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And uh, was there for about a year. And in the meantime, back in 1980, when, I, when His Holiness invited me back to India to meditate, I was given by a, a truly marvelous Tibetan yogi by the name of Gen Chama Wondu. Uh, he's good, old friends with Lama Zubha Rinpoche, Gen Lama Rinpoche, and so forth. But Gen Chama Wondu was a yogi's yogi. And he moved into Geshe Raptan's empty cabin, left his cabin vacant. So he invited me to do my retreat in his cabin. And um, so at that time, one of the yogis, Tibetan yogis living at there, about an hour and a half hike above McLeod Ganj, above Dharamsala, one of the yogis living up there was Gen Lam Rimba. And he allowed me to come and drop in on him once a week, uh, just for me to consult with him about my practice. His holiness was guiding my practice, but he had a few other things to do with his time besides guide me. So I couldn't just drop in on him whenever I wanted to, as Gen Lam Rimba was more available. So I would see His Holiness whenever I could, but Gen Lam Rimba I got to know quite well and developed a real friendship with him, but a very, very deep sense of reverence and respect. He's just a, a tremendous yogi, a wonderful monk, scholar, and contemplative. So we got to know each other that way. And then 
after I'd finished up at Amherst, and that was in 86, then with a bit of preparation, and I asked His Holiness whether he would allow Gyanlam, if Gyanlam Rinpoche wished to come, whether he'd be willing to come and lead a one-year shamatha retreat, a group retreat, because I've been teaching in Seattle for some time at that point, and aroused a certain amount of interest in this. And he consulted with His Holiness. His Holiness told him, yes, it would be a good idea to come. So he came for all of 1970, no, 1988. 1988, he led, and I was kind of his apprentice, a one-year shamatha retreat for 12 people. And it went very, very well. Everybody in the retreat said it was the most meaningful year of their lives. But in terms of my interest in shamatha, that goes back much, much earlier. Back to Geshe Rapten. I, you might know that I wrote his biography and the life and teaching of Geshe Rapten. He emphasized shamatha then. Uh, the first teacher, the first lama from whom I received sustained and very rigorous training was Geshe Ngaman Taige. Because I went to Dharmazala expressly because under the auspices of His Holiness Dalai Lama, the Tibetan, works, the, 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 the Tibetan li Library of Tibetan Works and Archives had just opened the doors. And uh, they, were, they held a one-year course in Buddhism. And so I went from Switzerland to, uh, to Dharmazala because of that course. I was studying with a Sakya Lama in Switzerland, and I wanted to go to Nepal and find a cave with some yogi in it. they take one look at me and say, my chela, my chela, you know, lead me to enlightenment. Uh, but this bulletin came from Dharamsala and my, the Sakya Lama in Switzerland said, go there. So I just made a beeline there. But Geshe Ngaman Taige, when he was teaching, uh, he taught all of Lamrim, he taught the guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. He also taught the Abhisamaya Lankara, or the ornament, for, the, the ornament for clear realization. And in all of these teachings, including Shantideva, Shaman is there. I mean, it's very explicitly there. And I remember very vividly, I don't want to go on too long here, but I remember very vividly when, Gen, when Geshe Ngaman Taige was teaching his Lama and he got to the Shamatha, just before the Vipassana, of course. He said, well, why don't we practice a little bit? He'd been teaching us, you know, the by the book. Uh, and then he said, well, let's practice a bit. So there's just eight of us in this one-year course. And so, he's, so I'm, I'm up for it, you know. So we, we sat there, and he sat like, there was, like a stone Buddha. And after 20 minutes, I and I think the others in our class were getting, getting fidgety and uncomfortable. And half an hour goes by, we're getting more uncomfortable. An hour went by. He's not moving in muscle. And then we're in physical agony. And two hours goes by. And three hours go by. By that time, we're basically you know, internally screaming our heads off. We're so much pain. And then Geshe Ngaman Taige gently opened his eyes, he looked at us and said, Shamath is not so easy. <laughs> So, but he, he said many things that really captured my attention. He said, you know, if you've achieved shamatha, then Vipassana is easy. And when he was teaching us the Abhisamalankara, this definitive presentation of the five paths, starting with the path of accumulation, culminating as a Shravak Arahat, on the Bodhisattva path, as a Buddha, uh, according to the lineage in which he was trained, and which I've received, if you want to reach just the first path, well, the, the crucial element is you so deeply cultivate bodhicitta, that arises spontaneously, effortlessly. But for that to happen, your mind has to be wonderfully stable, fit, free of the five obscurations. And for that, you have to achieve shamatha. Achieve shamatha, not just work at it, but you should have achieved shamatha, which indicates a very, very exceptional degree of mental health and balance. And with that basis, you cultivate bodhicitta to the point that it arises spontaneously. And then you reach the path. And so I listened to that and I said, well, that's the most important thing to do. And it was actually, oddly enough, it was a, actually a reason for me leaving, after about a year and a half, my formal monastic training, which was on the track to becoming a geshe. Because I'd received all the basic training in logic and debate and Buddhist psychology and, and so forth. And we were just about to begin six years of training, six years com continuously of the Abhasamaya Lankara, which we exhaustively in detail study the five Margas, the five paths, the ten Ayo Bodhisattva Bhumis. But there came a little interference on this trajectory, mm -hmm. and that is Goenka. Oh. Goenka, the Burmese meditation <coughs> master, he was invited to Dharamsala yes. to lead his 10-day retreat. And His Holiness told all of us in our monastery, we should all go. And so, well, then you go. Your, your root lama just said go. So it, and so there I was in Goenka's retreat, starting at like 4 o'clock in the morning, meditating 11 hours a day. And in in these 10 days, I looked at my mind and it was like an enormous garbage dump that was alive with living garbage. 
you know, just so much noise and agitation and imbalances and so forth. And I looked at this, and after about eight or nine days of this, I said, what would I be doing studying the five paths and the ten Aryabhadrasattva bunis when I can't even see the bottom edge of the lowest path? Because I'm way down here. And so why don't I just do everything I possibly can to try to reach the first path? But this means I don't need detailed knowledge of the five paths and the ten bunis. I just need to learn how to become a bit saner. So with His Holiness' permission, I dropped out. And once again, I dropped out. I dropped out of Western academia, and I dropped out of Eastern academia, and just went off and meditated. That's all I wanted to do. And then, so that, was, so that led to four years of retreat, from 80 to 84. And then Genlam Rimba came in 1988, and then he caught the Shamata retreat. And it just struck me ever since that this is something that is universally important in Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism is perfectly clear. I mean, any school of Buddhism, you have Shila Samadhi Prajna. You can't skip Samadhi. Don't blow it off with momentary Samadhi. That's a gimmick. Samadhi is more, more than just a little momentary business. It's something quite serious. And in the, in the Mahayana, in the Vajrayana, everywhere. Shamatha is everywhere cropping up. And yet, to my astonishment, as the years went by, it seemed that it was either overlooked, marginalized, or, or trivialized. And so it just struck me, this is a missing piece. So many things are taught well, really well, in the Theravada tradition, the Chan, the Zen, all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, many outstanding teachers and many outstanding teachings. And, I, and of course, a number of people teach shamatha, but not that many really emphasize it. And so I've kind of taken that to heart. So after hearing that, I can't help but ask a technical question, mm. where you, you're talking about shamatha and bodhicitta. And I'm wondering if you think that you have to it's necessary to achieve shamatha before you can achieve bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. yeah. The whole notion of achieving bodhicitta, uh, you as a scholar, you know, this is referring to in Tibetan, Jumamayambe Chanchukisem, uncontrived, effortless, spontaneously arising bodhicitta, such that you've cultivated it so deeply that it's your, more your, your default mode, your ground state, and it could be actively triggered by virtually anything. And then just bodhicitta is there, you know, it's a primary mind. It's not just an aspiration you have once in a while. It's like your prime directive. And when that sinks so deeply into your psyche, almost into your marrow, that it's just your, your desire of desires for which all other desires are derivative, uh, that's when you've achieved bodhicitta. And then at that point, you're a bodhisattva. So is it necessary to have fully achieved shamatha? And by that I mean, technically then, access to the first jhana. Uh, because that's... That's how the term is used in the, in the whole Indo-Tibetan tradition. Uh, there is scholarly debate on this point. In the tradition of Geshe Ngon Taige, Lama Zubar Rinpoche, Geshe Rapten, the Sera, the Sera Che tradition, they say, yeah, you need to fully achieve Yamata in order to bring about that depth and that degree of spontaneity of Bodhicitta. But other very, well, very erudite scholars say, Not entire, you don't need to achieve all nine stages. You certainly must have a stable mind. Certainly the five obscurations must be attenuated. There being kind of craving, sensual craving, laxity and excitation, uh, laxity and dullness, excitation and anxiety, and afflictive, afflictive uncertainty. I think I just, and, and then ill will, enmity. Uh, so those five have to be really in abeyance. It's hard to imagine a mind that is very prone to ill will and animosity in that same mind stream, bodhicitta rising. Yes. That's kind of like, that's, that's not going to happen. So there's scholarly debate whether you need simply a very good degree of samadhi. I mean, really good, like among nine stages leading to, to shamatha. Okay, stage five. Yeah. Gyan Lam said, he told me during that one year that I lived with him in 1988, during this one-year retreat, he said it was not uncommon in the Galupa tradition for very serious yogis like himself, uh, in terms of shamatha, just to go up to the fifth out of nine stages the fifth of nine stages. At that point, your coarse excitation is, is through. You can sit for an hour, maybe longer, with an unbroken flow of mindfulness, never completely disengaging from the meditative object. The mind is reasonably clear. Your samadhi is pretty darn good. And he said it was common in his tradition, the Galupa tradition, to achieve that uh, as, a, as a flat shamatha practice, focusing on an image of Buddha Shakyamuni, or whatever method you like. And then, with that degree of samadhi, then go right into stage regeneration practice, yep. and then finish off what you started within the context of stage regeneration practice. Yep. But in, in, as a point of fact, and Tsongkhapa points this out, Jujum Ling points it out, the great Nima Lama Lama Mipamana point out, 
um, they've all said from the 15th century until the present, relatively few people actually fully achieve shamatha. Most of them seem to be in a hurry. Yes. They'll achieve a little bit and then run up to stage regeneration or just do a lamrim or they're doing tummo or they're doing dzogchen or mahamudra. Uh, they're eager to get to the good stuff. Yeah. And shamatha, like, they're thinking, well, shamatha, Hindus do shamatha. How important could that be? <laughs> you know, a bit of sectarian bias comes in. <laughs> or the Hinayana, yeah. they do shamatha. How important could that be? You know, but that's just sectarian talk. Uh, it is enormously important. And there's, there's a story from Buddha's own life after he had finished his six years of ascetic practices, damaged his health, restored his health, and you might recall from the Nikayas, then, then the Buddha, the Gautama, at the age of 35, was wondering, what now? Because he'd already tried samadhi, he tried all these ascetic practices and so forth, and then he recalled a time as a youth, maybe he was 12, 13 years old, something like that, where he was simply sitting quietly under a rose apple tree while his father was out doing some ritual, a, a royal ritual. And he spontaneously slipped into the first jhana. Just slipped right into it. Sense it withdrew, the five obscurations went down, the mind was supple, it was filled with well-being, with a sense of what, bliss and so forth. And most importantly, really fit for action. You know, supple, prashrapta, that, san that Sanskrit term. Suppleness, malleability. And then, as it's, that it cropped up spontaneously, then when the ritual was over and he had to get on with his life, then it also subsided. He got it, but it was just a taste. Uh, and, but he recalled at the age of 35, he recalled that, that first jhana. And, he, and then the thought arose in his mind. He said, the thought arose in my mind. Might that be the way to enlightenment? And then the answer came back, yes. And so then, in a relatively short time, he re-achieved the first jhana. And then on that basis, it's history achieve perfect enlightenment. But he himself indicated in that statement, the first jhana, it's, all, it's very good to achieve more, but that one, I think there's pretty, I think among really knowledgeable scholars, like Kiminda Tera, an outstanding Theravada scholar, and very widely accepted in the, in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, that degree, this access to the first jhana, or the full first jhana, these are indispensable to really proceed along the path, to become a, on, the, on the Shravaka jhana, to become a stream mentor and so forth, and on the Mahayana path to become a bodhisattva and proceed on the bodhisattva path. This is, this is the kind of the, the gold standard of what I would call mental health and balance. And you need an exceptional degree. Because Vipassana is not just about, of course, stress reduction or gaining an insight here or there. But Vipassana, in union with, Vipassana, with Shamatha, which is the Buddha's great innovation that had never been taught I think in the, in the tradition of Indian contemplative heritage, prior to the Buddha, it was a great innovation. Uh, it is that combination of shamatha and vipassana that has the power to completely eradicate mental addictions from the root. So that really caught my attention early on. And I just felt you can't skip shamatha. Or you can, but then none of your other practices will come to full fruition. Very nice. I think um, maybe we'll just finish with one more. Um, I'd like to, you to speak about, I'd like to fast forward a little bit to you meeting Gyaltro Rinpoche and um, coming into contact with the Dzogchen teachings again because, you know, back yeah. with uh, Evans Wentz's book, you, you, it sure. first started your path. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit with, you know, your earlier training was all with Gulug and Tsongkhapa and I was wondering how you integrated the, your earlier training in the Gulug lineage with the uh, Zogchen teachings, if you could just speak a little bit to that. Sure. I'll try to be concise, which all my students know I'm terrible at. Um, yeah, I was, my initial inspiration to follow the, the path of Tibetan Buddhism, or into Tibetan Buddhism, was this book on Dzogchen. Uh, but then circumstances simply unfolded in such a way that I had really no access to Dzogchen teachings for 20 years. It was there, and I was immensely nourished, both in terms of growth of understanding and knowledge, and also an ever-increasing sense of meaning uh, through those 20 years. I, I wouldn't give away one year of it. It was 20 years very well spent. Uh, and, and by the time I was 90, uh, no, I was 90, 19, 1990, <laughs> don't tell how old I was. By the time of 1990s, I was 40 years old. Uh, I think Plato said that's when, you, when you're allowed to start, start studying philosophy at the age of 40, I think he said. So I had 40 years under my belt. And one of my oldest and dearest Dharma friends is a woman named Sangye Kando. He's a very accomplished translator, teacher, really an outstanding person. 
and uh, we'd, be, we'd, we'd been buddies since 1972 or so, way back. And so we kept in touch, just in a very nice friendship. And she, early on, years and years before 1990, she'd become a very close disciple and an interpreter for Gyaturamuchi. So I would drop in on her once in a while, and I'd meet her lama, and we'd I'd get to know him a little bit, checking him out, you know. And then in 1990, by that time, I had spent a couple of years in retreat out of academia and decided to continue my education. So I went to, uh, I matriculated at Stanford in the, in the PhD program in Religious Studies. And uh, so I was living there in the Bay Area, but really knowing that if I stayed only in academia, it would be quite arid from my perspective. Uh, lots of fact and not a whole lot of meaning in the methodology, you know? Because it's just radically not oriented towards practice. Keep the, ob uh, the objective stance, which means stand outside of and don't go native. Uh, whereas I was, I, was na I was already a lost cause. I was native already. And so Gyatran Abuchi very happily decided to move down from Oregon for a while to the Bay Area. And so he gave some teachings on dream yoga in 1990. Sangha Kanda was translating, he gave it in San Jose. And I'd received teachings on Dream Yoga from Zong Rinpoche, a great, yeah. very great uh, Gelupa Lama, back in 1978 in Switzerland. I served as his interpreter for all the six yogas in Europa. So I had some acquaintance, but Geshe Rapton, who organized this, invited him to give us his teachings. He told me, just flat out, I want you to receive these teachings now, but it's over your head. You know, just get the imprints now, but don't think about practice, you're not ready yet. So that was so now 12 years later. Gyatran Bhutch is teaching dream yoga, but he's teaching it like you can really practice this. You're teaching it experientially. And in this kind of this mengak mode, this mode of pith instruction, there's nothing academic about it. And I just drank it in like nectar. And so it, it was just a very strong connection. I said, okay, this, this is a person I'd love to re, you know, have as one of my lamas. And so as it turned out, uh, just a, a marvelous opportunity rose up for me. Uh, for the next seven years, from 1990 through the end of 97, I wound up being his, his primary interpreter. He's living in the Bay Area. Sangha Kanda was up in Oregon. So various circumstances came together. So I had the just priceless opportunity to serve as his interpreter. For the last two years, I was living with him, uh, just in a little cottage across from his. And so he gave those teachings, Sangha Kanda translating. And then, not too long after that, he had been invited down to the Shambhala Center in Hollywood. And he said, Alan, I'd like you to come down and translate for me. I said, sure, glad to, honored. So he came down to the Shambhala Center, and I think it was 1990, 1991, long time ago. And uh, he picked out two chapters from a great text on the union of Mahamudra and Dzogchen by Karma Chame, which hasn't been translated. Simply called the Del Chen, the great commentary. And he picked out two chapters within the Mahamudra Dzogchen tradition, Shamata and Vipassana. And that's how he started me off. So I was getting shamatha, you know, all the way through from every, every teacher, really. And it was just breathtaking. And seeing, whoa, here was this smooth segue. Because Geshe Rapton, back in 1976, had taught us, uh, and I was interpreting for him, Penchen Rinpoche's text, his root text and commentary on Mahamudra. So, and it just enchanted me. It really drew me. So during my four years of solitary practice, I went a lot in that direction. And now Gyatra Rinpoche is teaching it from the union of the Kagyu and Nyingma traditions. Whereas I had it from the union of the Kagyu and Galupa tradition. So it was this seamless transition. And so he taught those, and it was just like, I was just thrilled. I mean, literally, I was thrilled. And so he continued staying on there in the Bay Area. And then he just taught one text after another, and every single one of them, a spacious path to freedom, naked awareness, natural liberation, Padmasambhava's teaching of the six bardos. Uh, he taught a short text by Jujun Rinpoche on Shamadeva Vipassana. He taught the Vajra essence, every single text that he taught. Well, during those seven years that I was translating for him, every single one emphasized the enormous importance of marga, of path. We're here to not just practice dharma, but to reach the path and move along the path, the fourth noble truth after all, and every single one of them emphasized shamatha. So I had this from every side. And so he has just been my, like my spiritual father, and my primary Dzogchen, Dzogchen Lama, and the, the teachings that he's passed on to me, and authorize me to pass on to others is just it's a fulfill, fulfillment of my heart's desire. But happily, my root lama, of course, is his whole Dalai Lama. And of all the Galupa Lamas, and he is largely a Galupa Lama, he, more than any other I know, with no comparison, completely integrates the teachings on Dzogchen, which he received from Dingo Kensu Rinpoche and other great Nyingma Lamas, and his whole, his whole formidable Galupa background. 
and I received on multiple occasions Dzogchen teachings from him. And so he made it very easy for me. Here's, you know, the Lama of Lamas, as far as I'm concerned, and seamlessly integrating these. And that's what I've, I, that's what I've sought to do for the last 26 years. So it's been in no way an abandonment of my background in Theravada. I lived for six months in Sri Lanka, studied with Ananda Maitreya, a formidable Sri Lankan teacher, monk, scholar. He took me under his wing and trained me. Uh, so it's in no way a disengagement from my Theravada background, the Galupa, but rather it, the one translation of Dzogchen is the great encompassment, the great completion, the great perfection, they're perfectly good. But the Dzogchen makes sense of all of the different paths. And from my mind, not only within Buddhism, but actually it enables me to make sense of spiritual traditions outside of Buddhism. And for that matter, quantum cosmology and certain elements of philosophy of science and philosophy of mind. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So I think we're going to have about a five-minute break, and then Alan's going to come back and give us a short Dharma talk. Thank you.